Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from Investor Stream, and I'll be your host this morning. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. We've had almost 100 people register, which is a fantastic result given uh, the relatively short notice. Now, today we have Lindian Resources CEO, Alistair Stevens, who will discuss further details on the commencement of the Stage 1 processing plant development for the Kangan Kundi Rare Earths Project in Malawi. Alistair will be on hand to address any questions following the presentation. Uh, you can download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. A copy of the webinar will also be available on when Lindian's website and social media platforms later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Alistair to kick things off for us. Alistair, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for attending this update uh, on the basis of uh, the, the ASX release we made earlier this week about the progress associated with uh, processing facilities at Kangangkundi. So um, I'd like to now start that presentation by Alex going to the disclaimer. There will be some forward-looking statements in this presentation associated with uh, essentially it's a roadmap informing shareholders about what our timeline of development in the future is like. So there are forward-looking statements so that disclaimer has some relevance in the context of this presentation. Thanks Alex. Um, corporate overview is that uh, we have 1.027 billion shares on issue is 33 million performance rights and 97 million options, which are all in the money, which will precipitate into about $20.7 million worth of cash once converted. So our market capitalization is around about $390 million. As usual, the snapshot of the company is there's two assets, Kangan Kundi, the king, which is, uh, as I've always said, the most strategically important developing rare earth project in the world with a short runway to production, destined to be a major supplier and a key player within the rare earth industry globally. Now, bauxite assets in Guinea, where there's a billion tonnes, we've announced earlier, uh, just recently, an offtake agreement for 23 million tonnes over six years, which at current prices should net something like $60 per tonne on an FOB basis in Guinea. This presentation will focus on Kangangundi, so I asked investors to uh, check the website for the details of our bauxite assets. Putting a lot of effort into our uh, footprint for ESG. Uh, what's remarkable about this is the operation is ideally structured such that uh, you know we're going to have a very low environmental footprint. So we have a water gravity separation uh, technique with lots of water recycling. So there's lots of water preser present, uh, preservation and a very low or non-existent chemical footprint. We've got access to sustainable power. There's an electric hydroelectric grid nearby. Although stage one will probably start off with gas or diesel fired power generation, our future programs would to migrate to that hydroelectric grid and some kind of sustainable and integrated system. I mean, discussing about environmental care in terms of reforestation programs, agricultural sustainability, and of course, importantly, our product is non-radioactive. So we have a zero radioactive footprint, which is a very distinguishing feature for any rare earth project in the world. We've been very, very careful about making sure we maintain community relationships in the best possible way. We've got a subcommittee now of what's called the Area Development Committee, who are a direct liaison uh, involvement group with project development. Uh, so we're talking now about um, programs for development, and then it comes about education, training, employment opportunities, and the way that we become not just a visitor, but an integral part of the community. And then it gets down to sustainable mining. If all these things come in place and we get access to this grid power system, we've got the potential of having electric mining fleet and electric like vehicle fleet, therefore uh, reducing our carbon footprint even further. Just want to uh, touch on the NDPR or the, the market outlook for the Kanga Kundi Rare Earths. This is an NDPR project. NDPR, for those who don't know, is used in the production of very small but very powerful, very permanent magnets. And those magnets are then used in electric motors. Those electric motors and devices are used in things like the biggest growth market, which is electric cars, but also things like robotics, wind turbines, MR machines, phones, tablets. They've got an extremely diverse range of use. But the biggest growth market of all, next slide please, is the electric car market. Um, and the growth forecast in that market is predicted to be around about you know, 62,000 tonnes of a supply gap between now and 2030. So there's a massive demand for NDPR 
in the market at the moment. And as you see on that, that bar chart on the very right hand side, consumer electronics do form a component of it, wind turbines a little bit of it, but by far the greatest growth market at all is the automotive uh, drivetrain um, uh, market. So uh, next slide please. Now to touch on where the local uh, just briefly, um, for those who don't know, the projects like had in Malawi, which is a southern and eastern African project and uh, country, the project's located to the south. We have two licenses. The blue box there is the exploration license. The red box is the mining license that we have. It's located about five kilometres or very close to this infrastructure. The yellow lines are the, uh, the M1 highway and major roads. The dash, uh, black and red line are high, high voltage hydroelectric power lines. Uh, the grey and white dash lines are rail facilities, so there's only about 10 kilometres away. And there's a town to the north called Balaka where there's about 36,000 people, where there's a um, substantial amount of services and facilities available for access to the site. Next, please. So when we look at the project uh, on a lot closer um, scale, we have um, the location of the processing plant, the mining operation is annotated there within the mining license and the mine access road uh, to the highway, which is five kilometres in length. And there on the right is a preliminary layout of what the process plant and other facilities look like in admin building, crib rooms, storerooms, workshops, process plant location, and um, a box there for future expansion for stage two. And just to recap, on the dimension of this um, project. This is a view of the project looking south. So that's the north face we can see of the hilltop, which rises 200 metres above the surrounding plain. Those striations you see on the, on the uh, hill face there are actually trenches that were put there by Lonro and BARGM in their sampling regimes. I've now annotated it so that the underground portal is there. You can actually, if you've got good eyesight, you can see a road going to the portal where BRGM did a, an edit that was 300 metres uh, to the south with cross cuts for bulk sampling. And there on top, the mineralisation is present on, on the entire view of that image. So it is present over about 800 metres north-south and about 700 metres east-west. So that gives you a, a feel for the dimension of the size of this mineralisation. There's been three, oh sorry, there's been two drilling phases so far. Phase one's complete, which is our drilling program from the surface of the hill, which completed 14,000 metres. Um, we've got some assays in the laboratory at the moment, so those results to the completion of that uh, program will be due very soon. Um, then that phase is obviously finished now. We're halfway through or more than halfway through our exploration uh, assessment phase, which is phase two, which are two deep holes underneath the mineral resource estimation drilling. And phase three, which is in planning now, is an update to uh, an, what will probably be an inferred resource in phase one to an integrated category by the end of this year. This section gives you a perspective on um, what the resource drilling versus the exploration target drilling looks like uh, geometrically. So above the red line there is the area where we'll define a, a mineral resource estimate. The exploration target drilling then is that long deep hole number 74 that goes way underneath the MRE resource drilling into that exploration target zone. The purpose of that is to demonstrate A, first of here's the mineral resources sitting on the surface and B, here are two drill holes which um, project that mineralisation, that depth. So it gives investors and the market a perspective on the kind of size and dimension that this project would be. Uh, and we, you know, I'm looking at, at the drill hole traces so far, very encouraged with the textural um, features we have, which are similar to for textural features on the, on the surface. We've done metallurgical uh, test work. Uh, we've determined that, the as we've reported already, that the recoveries are around about 70% um, and concentrate grade of 60%. The average NDPR ratio for the project is 20%. As I said before, it's non-radioactive, probably the most unique a feature of this, not only just from its environmental footprint, but from its marketability perspective, um, having a non-radioactive product is extraordinary within the rare earth uh, um, industry and is one of the things that's a real blessing, uh, both commercially and environmentally. Um, and a price per kilo, well, uh, that's uh, to be negotiated at this point in time, but 
We've, um, we've got a handle on what we think the value of the product is, and we'll be looking through in the next six months with marketing and offtake agreements to actually uh, precipitate that into our announcement at some point in time in the future. When we first announced the low sheet design of the plant, we had spiral shaking tables, MGSs and then WIMS, and the latest test results where um, the work metallurgical work programs we won't take at the moment is that we can eliminate the tables from part of the process. So we're simplifying our circuit substantially and successfully. So it's now become simply a spiral separation, multi-gravity separation recovery, and then magnetic separation to clean the product up into final product. Um, so those uh, initially the first round of metallurgical uh, assessment was done on 130 kilo sample on a, one specific area. We've now got two samples, two 300 kilo samples from different areas, which will give us a better spread and distribution of the mineralization between two rock types, the carbonatite and the breccia. And the next phase will be they've got some, just received some drill holes for metallurgical test work, which will give us variability analysis. So that's variability a long strike, but also down depth. So it's, it, they're all de-risking exercises in terms of metallurgical performance. At this stage, the design of this plant is for two 230,000 tonne per annum mills in the grinding circuit. So if the next slide, please, will demonstrate graphically what the plant looks like. Now, on the left-hand side there, there's a retaining wall. That's an existing retaining wall that was put in there by BHM. So we're using that facility at the moment um, for our foundations. And to the left of that, up the top, is the ROM pad. So Downstream from that, there's three work areas. One is grinding and classification, which is on the left there with the mills painted in red. The central area is the recovery circuit. So at the top, you've got the multi-gravity separators. The shed um, to, the le uh, to the front of our image is the concentrate uh, filter pressing and packing facility. And the third work, work area on the right is the tailings of um, thickener, uh, which then goes off to the tailings uh, storage facility. And you'll notice that there's some gaps between the mill and the recovery circuit, and there's a gap between the recovery circuit and the tailings um, thickener. And that's purely because there are three work areas and there's some plumbing, which we'll be doing in the next month or two to tie in all those areas into one continuous circuit. So this is a snapshot of the present uh, outlook or design of the processing facility. As I said, the first mill will be installed, which will have a capacity of 220,000 tonne per annum. We'll then upgrade and put the second mill into 440,000 tonnes per annum. Now, this is designed to be a small skid-mounted um, um, demonstration facility that will demonstrate the capability of this project to produce a concentrate. And it'll also be used to optimise and de-risk it and that's for the purpose of that we see that the next stage, stage two, will be a much larger operation at 1.5 million tonnes per annum. So the whole purpose is keep the cost low, keep this plant nimble, operate it for a period of time which demonstrates its capability, de-risks for the second stage, which is to become a major producer. And then down the bottom now says other stages based on market demand. This will be built so that there's potentially a capacity for duplicating 1.5 million tonne per annum plant operations based on market demand. So this one gives you a snapshot of what are our programs in development timeline. Uh, the mineral resource estimate is due sometime uh, early July. Our expiration target will be sometime after that, probably around about September or later in that quarter. Um, and the MRE update is likely to be sometime in the last quarter of this year. Met metallurgically, phase one is complete, phase two is underway, and there'll be progress reports on the outcomes of that from here to um, August. And the phase three, which is that drill hole variability test work I was talking about, is also in progress. We're very, very close to finalising our flow sheet design. Our process design is near complete. It's about 80%. As I said, there's uh, bits and pieces in terms of plumbing to connect the, uh, the facilities together, the three work areas, grinding, recovery and, and thickening. We're well and truly advanced on our civil engineering works. Uh, we've had meetings with the community about upgrading the road. Next meeting will be 
um, the look and the design and the footprint of the plant operation and opportunities that exist for employment. In terms of our plant construction, uh, so civil engineering should kick off somewhere around the last quarter of this year. And then obviously that will lead then into plant construction in 2024 with a target that we'll probably be commissioning very late in 2024, but certainly into operations in 2025. And I like to always re-emphasise this. We have an exploration licence. We have a mining licence. We have an environmental certificate. So we are fully permitted and fully certified to go into a mining operation. And that's an important leverage. That's why we've been able to escalate this project so quickly. And the last slide, which is to recap, you know, I'll say it again. This is destined to be the, the world's greatest rare earth deposit. Uh, it's got... Um, you know, massive potential for size. It's got capability of scalabilities for expansions in the future. It's got a non-radioactive concentrate. It's going to have a near carbon zero footprint. It's got um, uh, programs around that which can, um, you know, in terms of reforestation, agricultural um, benefits, social um, uh, facilities that will, you know, make it particularly unique on the mining stage. It is tenured to mining license and environmental certificate. we well, gravity separation, great recoveries, fantastic concentrate grades, non-radioactive. And as I said, this is a near-term ready operating asset. Well, here's the proof. We're well and truly down the path of actually getting our uh, project into construction for operation in 2025. Now, the potential long mine life that will precipitate out once we see the MRE and the results of the exploration drilling, we'll be able to articulate more, more, more um, uh, cleverly what our long life mine potential looks like. So that will come out and be articulated in the second half of this year. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, some, uh, some great information in there, I think everyone would agree. Now, we have a, a number of questions that have come through. Um, Alistair, turning to the Phase 2 drill program, uh, can you provide any colour on the, what the core is looking like for the first 980, mil, 980 metre diamond hole, uh, say below 400 metres? To answer it properly, the first 150 metres was designed to be drilled in, in waste material as a pre-collar to a, a long hole through mineralisation. And the important thing was that that boundary was very close to what the guys were anticipating as being the boundary between the low-grade um, mineralisation and the carbonatite itself. So that gave us quite a confident that We've got the geometry in some respects right in a lot of the areas. Uh, the first half of the hole has been sampled and dispatched, so we should see assays for that within the next month or so. Um, and the second lot of, of assays have been uh, cutting and sampling has been completed, and I believe it's been dispatched from site now. So we should see results from that in the future as well. But in terms of its texture, very confident now that uh, the mineral or the textural mineralisation we're seeing is very much consistent with the surface and there's been some revelations in terms of our understanding of the mineralisation which gives us a lot more confidence about the grade and tenor uh, at depth or the potential. But ultimately it comes down to the assays which will come to the market in, in the short term and we'll be able to demonstrate that the mineralisation persists at depth, hopefully, based on the assays. Thanks, Alice. Now, turning to off-take discussions, how advanced are they? And are there several parties that are interested? There are many parties that are interested, not just several. Um, and they have engaged quite early in the process, identifying the fact that, you know, historically, this is a brownfields development. So there's been some data that's been available to some institutions that gives them the confidence that this is a project of significant magnitude in terms of its capability of producing A, rare earths and B, NDPR. So they've been... Uh, in our um, engagement for a long period of time. And that, like marketing, it all based on relationship management. It's not just purely a transactional one. It takes time to become a partner in this process. So we've had a lot of groups come to site. They've been validating in their own mind what the mineralisation looks like, you know, becoming comfortable what the operation will look like. And I would expect that those relationships plus more will precipitate out in the next six months once people get a handle and a view on the size, dimension and capability of our stage one processing facility. Thanks, Alistair. So would you do multiple offtakes? Is that something that you're potentially considering? Of course. Um, you know, not everyone will want 
all the products. Some people want um, the whole offtake. Some will want a component of it. Um, the nature and the structure of that really comes down to commercial viability of who puts the best proposition onto the table. And so we, we've sort of established that um, there's a, a plenty of interest and uh, the discussions are quite advanced. Um, do you have any timelines for, for finalising these offtakes? Well, no. I, I anticipate that something will precipitate out in the next six months. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any need for a great rush on that at this point in time uh, because uh, there's some work programs that will assist not only just in off-takers understanding what the volume of product we're going to produce is, but also our ability to actually leverage on the value of the product being sold into the market. But uh, I would anticipate that something will happen within six months, 12 months at the latest. Thanks, Alistair. So where does stage one place you in terms of comparisons to other rare earth concentrate producers around the world? To do that, you have to have an opinion on grade, which I think is important to let precipitate out of the mineral resource estimate. My view, where we're certainly within the top 10 uh, producers in the world, um, and uh, if the grade, what I'm seeing, will be certainly well and truly up the ladder from that capacity. Uh, I think once we get to stage two operation, we're clearly a major producer or a highly influential um, market participant. So you mentioned all the options are in the money. How will you fund this stage one and your next US $10 million milestone payment? Um, there are multiple options open to us. Um, certainly, you know, if you look at the history of what uh, the company has done is we've raised money at, the pre at a premium to the share price in the last three raises. Um, you know, when we were six, we did it at 10. When we were 13, we did it at 20. Uh, we've just, when we were um, 21 cents, we did one at 26. Uh, so there's a history of capability of, of raising at a premium. And I think that reflects just uh, some people's perception on just how good an asset this Kangan Kundi rare earth project is. So we have um, multiple avenues for equity to be raising. Um, what we've discussed and what we see in the market quite commonly now is the ability to do combinations of debt, equity and prepayment. So these market agreements become quite interesting in that it allows you access into uh, funding arrangements that you wouldn't have traditionally seen. So some of those are a prepayment on your offtake agreement which you uh, like a debt facility that you pay um, once you're in production that comes out of uh, your revenue. Uh, you can do combinations of that premium payment with debt and equity. So there's a lot of um, um, options that we have that gives us a great deal of flexibility, which will be the ultimately what we see as being the best outcome for shareholders. And that ultimately means share value and lack of dilution. So can you just... Uh confirm if you can um the mineral the main mineral resource estimate is due or you're expecting it to be due the first week of july oh it's probably first week it's in that first couple of weeks of july so i'd say early july is a better um, catchphrase from that just remembering we've got 2000 assays um or 2000 samples hitting the laboratory very shortly there are something like a quarter of a million data points for the resource geologist to a um, geostatistically understand and become you know which comes out with a, a resource estimate there's a lot of documentation that goes with that so it's going to be um, quite a substantial exercise we are the 15th of june so we're halfway through it uh, I would say that they would need at least the next couple of weeks to let those assays come through and their geostatistical analysis to precipitate such they've got the domaining of the geological uh, mineralisation zones uh, correct and accurate to the point of, of accuracy that we have with our spacing, our drilling. And then there's become a reporting behind that. So I would give them at least, you know, early July. It certainly won't be late July. So what percentage of the area will form part of the upcoming resource? Um, was multiple dimensions on that. We've done a lot of drilling north and south 
We've done a lot of drilling in the central part and the western zones. There is some uh, areas to the east which haven't been drilled to uh, a density that we'd like, and that's been because of constraints around topography. Some of the drill holes have gone to 300 metres, not, not a lot. Most of the drill holes are 150, and then there's a substantial amount that's sort of in that 200 to 250 metre range. Uh, so we've covered an area which is quite extensive. Um, the two deep drill holes are interesting. I, I don't know when the assays will then arrive, but when we put in uh, the location of the second larger, uh, deeper drill hole, um, we collared it actually in mineralisation. So there was some um, inference there that the northern boundary might push out a little bit. There's a collar to the west which hit mineralisation that we weren't expecting, so there's a bit that we've gained on the western side. Um, there's some drill holes that weren't all that successful on the eastern side, so we've lost a bit there. So we've, we're pretty happy that this space, certainly for this exercise, with the amount of meterages that we've drilled, you'd have to say that you know there's been virtually no, no mineral, uh, drilling done in unmineralised material. Uh, you know, 99% of our drilling has been successful in mineralisation of some sort. So it's been a particularly successful exercise from that perspective. So pretty happy that we've got most of the dimension of this project covered for this stage of development. So when do you think that second diamond drill hole will be completed? I would expect in the next couple of weeks. I would anticipate they'd probably finish it by June 30. Um, they're at 580 or 90 metres, I think I saw this morning. Uh, we've had a breakdown, so, you know, they're a bit slower than, than the other holes, uh, the last hole. So uh, I'm pretty sure by the end of this month, which means that you'd expect the assay turnaround in you know, six weeks or something like that from, from the completion of the hole. So I guess flowing on from that, do you have any idea on when this phase three infill program will kick off? Um, we're planning to kick it off in July. It's probably um, second half of July or thereabouts. The uh, important issue here is that we get the spacing of this infill drilling correct. If we uh, have a do too broader spacing, we'll have wasted the exercise because it won't be sufficient enough to actually um, classified as an indicator resource. If we get the spacing too close, then we waste money. So we need to actually um, see what comes out of the geostatistical um, analysis of the current database. And what the geostatistician will tell us is he thinks or she thinks that the mineral, the drill holes should be you know, X metres wide uh, and spaced, and therefore we can then go and plan our program next. So by the end of this month, I suspect we'll have a handle on what that infill design looks like and then start drilling in July. So moving back to the plants, a uh, bit of a, I guess, a three-pronged question, this one. Um, how long would you look to run the initial 220,000 tonne plant before moving to 440,000 tonnes? And then how long would you run the 440,000 440,000 tonnes before moving to the 1.5 million tonnes? Um, it comes down to really manufacturing. When I asked the engineering team, what would you do? Uh, when would you install the second mill? And it comes down to, well, how the, the, the critical issue is if we're going to build one mill in the, um, ma uh, the manufacturing facility in Johannesburg, uh, you've then got to build a second mill behind it. So it's going to be in parallel, sorry, in um, sequential uh, formation. So I would expect that if the, f the first mill was able to deliver it in July next year, for, as an example, then the second mill would probably be there around the end of the year. Um, so you'd be commissioning then six months apart uh, from that perspective. So I think that's what it it would generally look like, um, but I haven't seen the detailed Gantt chart for timeline or doing that at this point in time. How long would we run the 440,000? Remembering this is all um, small scale skid mounted um, facility, meant to be low cost, 
and it's probably not optimised perfectly in terms of its reco- um, you know, uh, process design, flow sheet and, and recovery. And the whole purpose is let's use this time to get it optimum, to understand what the ore performance is like, what the different mineralisation performs like, optimise our recovery, then we under, you know, basically we've de-risked the engineering part of the project. Um, and I think we'll get better performance out of those mills over time, but that remains to be seen based on operations. How long we run it for? It comes down to what does the market conditions look like and how quickly can we optimise this operation? So if it takes six months to operate, uh, to, to optimise, you might, we might say, okay, you know, we're ready for stage two. It might take 12 months to optimise, in which case, you know, you, you push out your stage two larger scale plant a little bit further. And then it comes down to market demand. If the market, um, it, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, there is the capability for this to be placed into the market many times over, many stage twos over and over based on the demand for NDPR. So it comes down to contract negotiations with offtake parties as to how much they want and how quickly they want it. Um, I, I would expect that we should be able to optimise this plant within 12 months to, to 18 months, which would then lead us into construction of a stage two on a um, confirmed offtake agreement. And you would operate stage one while you're constructing stage two. So there's a, a capability of just maintaining continuity of production rather than a stop start thing and of course then stage two can or stage one can keep going during stage two for as long as we want so there's a lot of combinations of of available available to us at the moment thanks alistair a couple more questions before we finish Uh, how much conservatism has been built into the updated timeline in the recent release i don't think it's conservative i think it's realistic um you always look at these things and you say what could interfere What's what hasn't haven't you planned, or you know what kind of things could interrupt um, the timeline of production? And some of them are you know completely unpredictable. So I think it's a realistic timeline for where we are at this point in time in project development. Thanks, Alistair. And final question: uh, What is the price vision of Lin- Lindian's final production? The price vision of product is that what the question is? Uh, yes. We're using MP Materials uh, financial reports as a guidance on what we think um, mineral concentrate is worth. And then there's some other data around the place about uh, monazite sales as a byproduct from mineral sands operations. The the MP Materials concentrate price looks to be, because it's a better product um, and it has... Uh, a re, you know quite low NDPR, but it's been looks like it's got a formula that's something like NDPR price times a discount, which might be somewhere between sixty to seventy percent times the ratio of NDPR in your concentrate. So, just an example from that: if NDPR price, because the mass is easy, NDPR price was a hundred dollars. 100 times 70 times 20% NDPR would mean we should realise something like $14 per kilo. Maybe that discount is 60%. NDPR price is, say, 75 or 80 Then you're looking at around about $10 a kilo. So that's the type of formula. What we're seeing is a severe discount to monazite material that's coming out of mineral sands operations. One, because it has uh, very low NDPR ratios, and two, it has extraordinarily high uh, radiation levels. And we're talking something around, you know, at best ones, probably 4%. Um, some of them are going 6 8% uh, thorium. And they get um, severely uh, um, uh, penalised because of that high radiation um, uh, um, component to the concentrate. Uh, and one, you know, radiation, transporting radioactive materials is expensive. It's a highly complicated regulatory environment. And then you're basically shipping someone else's radiation into another country, um, which countries do not like accepting radiation waste from other jurisdictions. Even within Australia, states don't like accepting radioactive wastes from other states. 
um, they'll take care of their own waste if you have it, but they don't like accepting it from, from other jurisdictions. And that's what where we see the monazite prices from those uh, operations being hammered very heavily um, down below, sort of down to about $7 a kilo is what we see on a market perspective. Then you have to say, well, what is the reliability of the supply chain from those mineral sands operations? And sometimes it's not all that good because it's highly variable. It's a byproduct, and therefore it's not your premium um, or your your focus of production. Whereas Kungunkundi, completely different. You know, it's it's a, it's focused on monazite mineral concentrate production. It's non radioactive, and it's destined to be you know a, a very very long life operation. So from that perspective, that gives my I shareholders my view on where we sit in terms of value. Fantastic. Well, look, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Again, I just want to reiterate, we had a sensational turnout today and uh, really appreciate you all joining me. i uh, also like to thank Alistair for taking his time uh, for the presentation and answering some questions. As I mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on Lindian's website and social media platforms later today. Alistair, before I let you go, do you have any final comments to leave with us today? Uh, just one thing for shareholders. Um, this is yeah, projects that develop this quickly you know, we are, are unique within the industry. Uh, we've been able to develop this very quickly for, for two things. One, board support. They've been able to provide myself and the team with a great deal of liberal uh, focus on development of this project, so I thank them greatly. Shareholder support is obviously sensational. I've had some great feedback from, from shareholders as to what we're doing. I reckon we should have another webinar on the birthday of this project, which will, you know, year one uh, will be the 29th of September when shareholders granted us approval to actually acquire the project and commence development. I'd like to have a webinar on that day to tell you just how far and how quickly and how much we've done in this sensational project. Fantastic, Alistair. Really appreciate you joining me. That wraps it up for us here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us and uh, all the best.